We'll continue the discussion we left open last, last time. Remember, we were, uh, were saying a few things about Ulysses. Uh, the overarching question of uh, Mary Marx, and, and your questions actually took Mary Marx in a, in, a, in, a, in a different and sometimes deeper uh, direction than I had uh, intended, um, is the whole issue of Ulysses, but around Ulysses, uh, Dante's reading of uh, uh, what we call the Hellenic world. Uh, around Ulysses, Ulysses is, uh, um, appears in Canto 26 uh, with Diomede, who is silent, Ulysses, uh, the polytropic intelligence of classical antiquity, the crafty um, mind. He's, uh, he appears as a philosopher, but also as a rhetorician. And, uh, the same, and, and this is exactly that kind of complicity between the two modes that, that uh, Dante wants to explore. Uh, but let me continue with this overarching theme. The, the overarching theme is uh, the reading of, uh, of the Greek the Greek world. You remember that we saw Eteocles and Polynes, that clearly for Dante is uh, the knowledge of which is filtered through uh, a Greek Roman poet, Statius, who was born and lived in a Greek Roman city, Naples. Uh, so uh, he's, he's discussing through Eteocles and Polynes the whole story of Thebes, uh, the, the, the two brothers who are enemies the enemy's brothers, and therefore the tragic history, the tragic knot of uh, Theban uh, mythology. Uh, then there's Diomede, who is, uh, uh, who is silent, and, but above all, the focus of the canto falls on uh, the, the greatness of this uh, hero. Ulysses, who I repeat, plays a pivotal role in Dante's imagination. He's a paradigm, he's a paradigmatic role. Dante can't quite get enough of him, nor can he get over uh, the, the, the phantasm of Ulysses. Ulysses literally appears in his dreams in Canto 19 of Purgatorio. And then Ulysses will also appear when Dante has to measure the great imaginative distance that he traveled when he's at the border of the physical and the metaphysical worlds. Uh, he looks back and he will see uh, Ulysses. Uh, or he'll remember, he will see the place which has been the place of Ulysses' transgression. Because this is apparently Ulysses' sin. Ulysses' sin is to have counseled, counseled his companions to go beyond the uh, boundaries of knowledge. It is, uh, this is, uh, so it's the effects of counseling. Let me just say one thing, that for Dante there is no figure which is more interesting, more important, more full of, for whom he has so many questions than the figure of the council. A council was, of course, Pierre de Levigne. How does he advise? How does he take the pressure? Oh, he's the secretary, hmm? the council. How does he take the pressure of the court? How, what does he counsel uh, uh, Frederick uh, uh, the Great, his emperor, with? And then we're going to see other councils. We're going to find very soon, later today, uh, a Provencal poet who literally advises war between father and son. He divides father from son. He breaches the unity of the body politic, and we'll come to that in, in Inferno uh, 28. So uh, Ulysses is the counsel who he gives the wrong counsel to his companions. He makes rhetorical promises, which he knows he cannot quite keep. They're grand questions, but uh, what questions does he, does he uh, pass on to his companions? What he says is, uh, 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 after the captivity, after their being in bondage to Circe, he wants to reform them, the companions, who, as you know, according to the story that Dante may have read in medieval accounts of Ulysses, had been metamorphosed into hogs, into pigs, into Epicureans, had yielded to the pleasures of uh, uh, sensual uh, happiness, the sensual understanding of happiness. And he says, you were not made, this is where the speech that he makes to his companions, you were not made to live as beasts, an allusion to Circe, to Circe's metamorphosis, but to 
pursue to follow virtue and knowledge. This is a grandiose uh, advice that he gives. A grandiose advice, but uh, which has one problem that Dante places him, and that's not necessarily the major problem. He places Ulysses and his companions as they are going to go beyond, as they are going beyond the pillars of Hercules. It is as if Dante implies and seems to agree with, if one were to read the trajectory of the Divine Comedy, that there is no knowledge worthy of its name unless it is connected to some degree of transgression. That somehow transgression is part of knowing, of an original and new knowing. Ulysses has to go beyond the limits of the known world in order to truly uncover, discover something uh, uh, anew that nobody else knew, that makes him, as they used to say, a Renaissance figure of la lettre. That's the way he's known. You know, there's, there's the famous joke of Ulysses, and then the graduate paper refers to Ulysses as the great hero who is with uh, one foot firmly uh, rooted in the Middle Ages, and with the other one, he salutes the rising sun of uh, the Renaissance. It's a little bit of a comical uh, account of Ulysses, but it gives you a sense of how, what the novelty that he, he, he represents. So there is this, this bit of a transgression, but Dante doesn't seem to be uh, terribly bothered by it, since he himself, under different circumstances, is engaged in exactly the same kind of uh, uh, transgression of the peribata, the ap apparently the geographic, the, even the cosmic, Perimeter. He goes beyond the sun. He's even, he even goes farther than, uh, than Daedalus and certainly farther than Icarus, these, these other mythical coordinates with them. How does Dante find out, uh, how does he want us to, to know that somehow the promises Ulysses makes to his companions, he wants to lead them to virtue and knowledge, may really be a faulty promise? And this is the, I think, the substance of the canto. Dante will refer to it with a famous metaphor as a mad flight. Remember, Ulysses recounts how they made a made flight out of the oars, mixing metaphors, as Dante had done before, the, 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 the maritime journey and the air journey. This is uh, the journey, the flight of the mind, the flight of the intellect, as if it were described by a sailor. Ulysses is a sailor. What, 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 how does Dante uh, make us aware that this is indeed there is madness in what Ulysses is trying to accomplish. Very simply, he puts him within a peculiar, distinct, a, a distinct political and rhetorical context. So that you really have to wonder, can he really deliver these promises? And what are the political consequences of the promises that he makes? The whole, the whole Canto 26 is literally littered with fallen cities. From this point of view, it begins with Troy, uh, with, I'm sorry, Florence, Dante has this apostrophe against the city of Florence, uh, the city of thieves, that's what he calls it, spreading its wings as if we're also, as if cities were like heroes engaged in great flights. Uh, there's a clear desire on Dante's part to have us connect the story of Ulysses' uh, uh, self uh, uh, degradation, turpitude, with the story of, uh, of, uh, of Ulysses, Florence's uh, uh, turpitude and Ulysses' uh, own fall. Then there is a reference to the city of Troy, fallen city. There is a reference to Thebes with the ref with, through Eteocles and Polynes. Uh, there is uh, also a reference to Rome. The, city, the canto is full of references to cities. From this point of view, canto 26 is a version a, a brief version of the epic, because the impulse of the epic is always political. No, there is no epic that you can think of which doesn't think about, is not trying to represent the, either the uh, falling cities and the edification of new cities, or for that matter, uh, some locating a city, it could be in a great grand metaphysical drama, it could be in the heavenly Jerusalem, or uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's Rome, it's Carthage, uh, it's Thebes, falling cities and rising cities. So uh, this is what the, the strategy of Dante. Dante's strategy is to show then how the grand philosophical claims of Ulysses have effects 
that make it appear as empty rhetoric. He, he Dante praises Ulysses nowhere, somewhere in the ocean, without a particular place. He goes from one city to another, and at the same time, because of this, he can never quite, doesn't seem to be able to deliver on what he has promised. It's a reflection on one particular aspect of the tragic story of Ulysses. It's the tragedy of language, a language that m contains with itself all the most incredible mirages, and yet it falls short of reality. Ulysses is literally placed in, uh, in, the, in the empty ocean, uh, away from all responsibilities and all locations. And it is this gratuitousness of his quest uh, that also accounts for uh, his being in, uh, uh, in, 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 in hell among the evil uh, counselors. Um, okay? So this is what I was trying to tell you last time, and I think that I have added on today a few other details, uh, but we can go back to that if, uh, uh, if, if there is to be a discussion, and I hope there will be a little later. Uh, let me turn now to uh, Canto 27, which I really like to read in conjunction, usually should be read in conjunction with Canto uh, 26, because we, here we have what I would call a counter myth to the story of Ulysses. There is a contraction of focus. Uh, uh, there is even a, a revision of the claims of epic grandeur that we have in Canto 26. Dante meets, and he's the one to become the interlocutor of Guido da Montefeltro, a, an extraordinary figure, a political leader, that's what he was, who then experienced the conversion. He became a Franciscan friar. And historically, this is a historical figure, historically he's called in by the Pope, Boniface VIII, by now you know him, he's not someone that Dante really holds in the highest esteem possible, and Boniface VIII, in an inversion of the relations between uh, priest and, and, uh, um, and cleric, high priest and cleric, asks Guido da Montefeltro for some advice. We are dealing again with evil counselors. And the advice is the following. You have to teach me, you're a great man of arms. You have to tell me what, is, what, is, what are the um, strategies I should pursue in order to conquer Palestrina, a small town. You may know it as a place of a, the origin of a great musician from there, but a small town near Rome. I want to conquer and destroy the city of Palestrina. You tell me how I am to do this. So we're really dealing with uh, Machiavellian, a Machiavellian world of counselors. Uh, uh, for Machiavelli, it's, it's uh, uh, actually the language of Machiavelli, avant la lettre, Machiavelli uses, takes the language, I think, that, that uh, uh, Guido will, you, will, will, will deploy for himself. At one point, Guido says, my works were those of, uh, not of a lion, but of a fox. And you remember, these are the two attributes uh, in the prince of Machiavelli that the man, the, the, the perfect prince ought to have. That is to say, uh, the perfect prince is the one who knows how to use strength, but how to use also slyness. You have to know when you have to be crafty and foxy. You have to know when to be, to be uh, violent uh, and lion-like. Two images that clearly originate from Cicero. It, they are not Dante's own invention, but, and it's likely that Machiavelli got them from, uh, from, from Cicero as well as from uh, uh, this, uh, this canto. The connections between the two cantos are several. And uh, let me just go, uh, first of all, it begins Canto 27. There is this reference to the Sicilian bull, clearly a counter to the Trojan horse of the previous Canto. A Sicilian bull which bellowed for the first time, and it was just with the cry of him who had shaped it with his file, used to bellow with the voice of the victim, so that though it was the brass, he had seemed pierced with pain, thus, etc. Uh, what is the story? It's exactly the same. A version in, uh, let's say, demotic vulgar version of the great situation of what has happened to Ulysses. Ulysses is condemned to be held prisoner in the flames, in the two 
uh, tongues of fire, literally tongues of fire, because here is a rhetorician, the philosopher, the Neoplatonist, who actually is a, a, a rhetorician, trying to persuade others about his, his, his ideas and managing and, 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 being, a, and being very, um, uh, being very f f proud of this, uh, his success, uh, but then he gets caught by his own tongue. It's always the temptation of the artist himself. It's Daedalus who builds the labyrinth and gets caught by it. It's the story of the artist who becomes a captive of that which he himself has constructed. This is true for Ulysses, a rhetorician caught by his own language. And here, Dante begins with the story of the Sicilian bull, the, the, the first victim of which was the artist itself. So I, I think it's literally a way of, uh, of, of reflecting on the scene that precedes it. Um, Virgil and Dante are interrupted. Lines 20, O thou, to whom I direct my voice, and who just now spoke in Lombard. What an extraordinary little uh, uh, misreading of the language, of the rhetoric deployed in the previous canto. You remember that in the previous canto, Dante uh, has Virgil go out of his way to say, no, no, don't talk to, to these people. Uh, they are Greeks, so let me talk to them. But now from the perspective of Guido da Montefeltro, they were not speaking some kind of uh, Homeric, uh, uh, Attic uh, uh, Greek. They are speaking a dialect of Italy, which is to say that language Language, it's not a question of uh, what kind of style you're using. Language always shows a sort of distance. It shows, it shows you yourself where you are. Uh, and uh, the kind of distance that you have from the world of truth or the kind of proximity that you may have to some self-complacency, as in the case of, uh, of, of, of Ulysses. So you who now spoke Lombard, clearly uh, a way of reading the pretense, the rhetoric or stylistic pretensions of the other two uh, speakers in the previous canto, saying, now go thy way, I do not urge thee more. Though I have come perhaps somewhat late, let it not irk thee to stay and speak with me. Thou seest it irks not me, and I'm burning. If thou hast fallen but now into this blind world from the sweet land of Italy, whence I bring all my guilt, tell me if the Romagnolis have peace or war, for I was of the mountain there between Urbino and the height where Tiber is released. As opposed to the uh, lofty rhetoric of uh, of, of Ulysses in the previous canto, who speaks through the grandest generalities about what is, the, what is the destination and destiny and fate of human beings, virtue, knowledge, the journey to the West, going through a hundred thousand perils. Here the language becomes, uh, there's a sort of deliberate diminution a contraction of focus, as if uh, uh, the language becomes one of, uh, indeed, local uh, peace and war between neighboring uh, towns. I will still bend down, and so, uh, et cetera. And then, uh, as a way of adjusting the, the register, the stylistic re register, Virgil will say to Dante, speak thou. He is Italian. Once again, on the surface, the observance of degrees of style and, and the laws of rhetorical decorum are always observed. And now th he continues, O soul, etc. Um, and uh, he will, uh, the pilgrim will inform uh, uh, Guido da Montefeltro uh, about the situation of Italy. This is the whole paragraph on page 337. And then uh, uh, Guido uh, goes on saying, if I thought my answer were to one who would ever return to the world, this flame should stay within another movement. But since none ever returned alive from this depth, if what I hear is true, I answer thee without fear of infamy. This is a passage that most of you remember very well. You may know this very well. It's a passage that uh, uh, Eliot, uh, T.S. Eliot, uses as uh, 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 an epigraphy, an epitaph, actually, for the love song of Prufrock. Uh, the, this, uh, so it gives you an idea of the kind of reading that Eliot has of his own, or this, uh, the solitary, this man, uh, uh, Prufrock, uh, uh, and, and uh, the kind of infernal reality uh, that his figure also evokes. What I want to emphasize, though, here, at the level of style, is how Guido speaks. Curses? 
hypothetical sentences, parenthetical remarks, that just a style that is deliberately goes contrary to the smooth, high, once again, high style of Ulysses in the preced preced pre preceding canto. And then I was a man of arms, and then a corded friar, thinking so good to make amends. And indeed, my thought had come true. But for the great priest, here is the curse against Boniface, may ill befall him who put me back in the old sins, and how and wherever and wherefore I would have thee hear from me. While I informed the bones and flesh my mother gave me, oh, another reference to birth, with which, as you know, characters start telling us their story. Uh, uh, making of birth, the, the first a major event of their lives. And then whatever happens, whatever biographical account may be a descent from or a deviation from the promises that that birth may have uh, held. Uh, while well, I informed the bones, etc., um, my, uh, my deeds were those not of a lion, but of a fox. This is Machiavellian, uh, eventually will become Machiavellian language. So we are moving into the secret halls of power. There were big deals are struck. Big deals are like the destruction of cities, where the Pope will ask the secret advice from his counselor. And let's see what he says. I knew all wiles and covert ways, and so practiced the arts. Um, I cannot but remark to you how Canto 26 also takes place through the language of concealment and covertness, right? Uh, even, uh, which is, uh, in Italian, it's actually the language for thievery at the same time, the furtiveness of it all. Remember Dante speaks of the sun through a periphrasis to say that it was hidden, uh, the sinners are hidden and concealed from view in the tongues of fire. Uh, this is the language of manipulation, of the political stratagems and machinations. And here it becomes highlighted and made visible to us. Uh, so he continues, the covert ways I came. When I saw myself come to that part um, of my life where every man should lower the sails, as if he were another, another mariner like Ulysses, and gathering the ropes, that which before had pleased me, then grieved me, and with repentance and confession I turned friar, and another curse, war or apostasy, war is me, it would have served. The prince of the new Pharisees, being at war a year, near the, uh, at war near the Lateran, and not with Saracens or Jews, for every one of his enemies was Christian, and none had been as at the taking of Acre or trading in the land of the Soldan, regarded neither the supreme office and holy order, or holy orders in himself, nor in me, that cord which used to make its wearer lean. But as Constantine, oh, it's really, we are moving within the. I said, I, I said the, within the, the halls of, at the we said the Vatican today, at the time was uh, the church of uh, St. John the Lateran, which was the residence of the, of the Bishop of Rome. Uh, and it was famous then, as it is famous now for the mosaics about Constantine's donation to Pope Sylvester. So uh, the whole issue of the, the temporal power of the papacy it really is to be seen, is to be glimpsed through this, uh, this uh, uh, scene of, uh, of Guido and Boniface. Uh, he asked counsel of me, and I was silent, for his words seemed drunken, and then he spoke again. This is the, the extraordinary caricature of the, of the Holy Office, giving uh, the, the absolution before even the commission of the crime. You can go and do what you want. I give you an absolution before you do anything. So it's, it's do not let thy heart this mistrust. I absol absolve thee henceforth, and do thou teach me how I may cast Palestrina to the ground. I have power to lock and unlock the new Peter to the uh, mm, heaven, as thou knowest, for the keys are two which my predecessor uh, the, the, did not hold uh, uh, dear. This is the famous story of Celestine, the fifth who gave up the office of the papacy and who stands even in the historical recollections and scholarship of today as the embodiment of one, of a, of a pope, of a figure who understood that the drama and the issue is always between power, maybe a little bit too dualistically, and holiness, and how the two for Celestine 
were really incommensurable and cannot quite, there could not be a dialectic between, uh, between the two, and he gave up. Dante refers to him uh, with a little bit of uh, um, harshness uh, for uh, not being heroic enough and, and uh, withstanding uh, the tide of corruption and deciding to retreat to, into contemplative life. Um, so then the weighty, let me continue. This is a little sermon that I apologize for. Let me continue with this. Then the weighty arguments drove me to the point where silence seemed to me the worst offense. And I said, and this is the advice he gives, simple and spectacular in its simplicity. Father, since thou dost cleanse me from this sin, in which I, ma I must now fall, I love that I must. I cannot, I find this so irresistible, especially because now I'm guaranteed of this absolution. I can really go on and do whatever I want. So there is not just a coercion on Rido, but a kind of pleasure that he feels. You know, he, he feels now that it's a necessity for him to go out and perpetrate and, and commit the evil he will, he will perpetrate. And this is the, pro the, this is the advice, large promises with scant observance will make thee triumph in the lofty seat. What is he saying? Make promises and plan not to keep them. Go and tell the people in Palestrina that you are going to respect them, that you are going to make them even rich, whatever you want to tell them. Then, of course, as soon as they open the gates of the city, don't keep this, any of these promises. This is the very statement, by the way, that one that finds its original source in Cicero's text about rhetoric, which is known as, uh, it, it's not really Cicero's, but it was thought to be Cicero's. And this is, uh, this is the text. It's to the, uh, from the, the, uh, uh, the person to whom it was uh, dedicated. It was meant for this Arenium. Uh, it was thought in the Middle Ages to be Cicero's uh, rhetorical treatise. And the rhetorical treatise uh, is based, this whole treatise, as many other treatises, are based on one premise, that rhetoric is the art of making the city and the citizens agree uh, in order to keep the city going. And in a, in a properly uh, governed city, promises are made and are always going to be observed. It's a way of explaining rhetoric in moral terms. What Dante is saying is that those kind of dictates, those kind of propositions can easily be turned around. And they are being turned around in the practice, in the historical practice. Then, et cetera, as soon as I was dead, Francis came for me. There is a little rivalry between Francis and the devil, uh, fighting over the soul of Guido. And Guido is, uh, uh, Francis loses. And uh, Guido is, of course, here in hell. I mention these details because you will see uh, that Dante will pick up this genre of medieval disputation when later in Purgatorio, in a, in a couple of weeks, we'll, we'll, we'll hit the canto, Dante meets Guido's son. Because in this poem, fathers and sons do not necessarily belong in the same moral space. And sons do not necessarily follow the footst in the footsteps of their, of their, of their fathers. Um, so you will see how Dante echoes this whole scene. And, and this is a kind of prefiguration. I'm giving you a prefiguration of things to come. And now we come, and, and I really want to pay a little bit of attention to this canto 28, because we're entering the, the world of the truly tragic world, uh, the, the, tragic, the, the most tragic section of the Divine Comedy. And I mention that because uh, from here to Canto 33, the story of Ugolino, we, we are going to talk about what does Dante think of tragedy and how can he go on really uh, envisioning the tragic. After all, I just call the poem, as he calls it, a comedy. What is the role and the place of a, the tragic? Is there room for the tragic vision in Dante's comedy? And the point is that the tragic I want to make this point now, and I will be elaborating it as we go on next time, especially next time. The tragic is never the final vision. And I will go on even saying something now that the essence of, of tragedy is always linguistic for Dante. It has to do with 
issues of the, the inherent ambiguities of language, the impossibility of decoding and deciphering what is being said by one particular, by state, one statement as opposed to another. Here Dante begins then with a reflection about tragedy. Where are we now? We are in, well, 10 to 28. It's the, the, the Dante encounters the one figure, uh, uh, the figure of so Bertrand del Born, who was a Provencal poet, um, a Provencal poet whom Dante actually admires greatly. In the, linguist, in, the, in the treatise on language that he writes, this famous, I have been referring to it, the De Vulgare Eloquentia, he singles him out, as he, Dante singles out Bertrand de Born as a great poet because he knew how to write the most difficult genre. He was a Provencal poet, you know who they are, the area of Provence, wedged between uh, the Ligurian part of Italy and, and France. The, the, uh, because he was such a great poet, because he knew how to uh, rhyme and, and, and write uh, war poems. So th this is really the most difficult type of poetry, aesthetically very difficult to, to sustain. And Bertrand de Bonne was a genius at this. Now Dante places him among the so-called makers of discord. This is in Canto 28, Bertrand de Bonne. Uh, and let's see how Dante starts with a reflection on war. I want to tell you a couple of things. This is uh, a canto, um, uh, a difficult canto. Uh, Dante begins with uh, uh, the story of, uh, by, by, with a reference to uh, uh, ineffability. Would you please read the passage? Because I, I, my, my, my version is... Uh, my English was the, from Canto 28, the first paragraph. Who could? Uh, yes. Do you want to do it? Would you like to do it, sure. please? Um, who could ever tell, even with words untrammeled and the tale often repeated, of all the blood and the wounds I saw now? Surely every tongue would fail, for our speech and memory have not the capacity to take in so much. Were all the people assembled again who once in the fateful land of Apulia bewailed their blood shed by the Trojans, and in the long war which made the high-piled spoil of rings, as Levy writes, who does not err, with those who suffered grievous strokes in the struggle with Robert uh, Viscard. Viscard, and those, or, those others whose bones are still in heap, heaps at Seferano, where every Apulian was faithless, and there by Tagliacoso, where, where old Alardo conquered without arms, and were one to show his wounded limb and another his cut off, it would be nothing to compare with the foul fashion of the ninth ditch. Very well read. Thank you. Thank you so much. Excellent. Uh, so what is this metaphor? It's, a, it's the, it's, we could call it a, the adoption of a, the, the so-called ineffability topos. You understand what I mean by ineffability topos? Is to say, usually it's uh, a, a device uh, a poetic device where the poet admits the difficulty or even impossibility of describing a particular reality. It's called ineffability. It's so sublime. Usually has to do with, uh, let's say, the vision of God. I cannot really go on. Whoever has seen God, whatever mystic may have had a vision, they always uh, uh, fall into the, the contingency, the facticity of language that uh, cannot quite grasp uh, the sublime quality of what they have seen. Dante now deploys the same uh, device for the world of, let's, say, let's call it for what it is, the evil world. It is as if hell now has its own sublimity, uh, a sublime quality that is a parallel and counter to that, well, that which Dante will witness in the divine spectacles at the top of paradise. Okay, so this is the first, the first thing. Language cannot quite be adequate to the reality it wants to represent. And what he's talking about now is uh, uh, all the, the, he wants to describe the whole of hell and all the limbs, the dismemberment of bodies uh, from all wars that cannot quite uh, come close to uh, what he has seen 
in, uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this area of hell. This is really uh, the idea. Um, and what Dante, first of all, will go on describing is, first of all, then the question of the ineffability, topos, which we'll see what it means in the unfolding of the canto. Um, and let me just continue actually with this. Then uh, uh, the canto really comes to a close with the meeting of a, with a poet, Bertrand del Born. So we go from uh, the language of, uh, of in the ineffable, um, and a language of the ineffable that is, has also this little detail, a reference to Livy, a Roman historian, and his voice and his authority are unquestioned. Livy cannot make mistakes. Historians uh, are unerring in their chronicles, in their accounts of what they have seen. But somehow the poetic voice is not quite the same thing as the, historic, the historian's voice. You see what, what the, the tension is in the first few lines of the poem. And then the, the, uh, the canto comes to a close with uh, uh, a different form of uh, poetic reflection. Uh, Dante is here describing something altogether different. The meeting of Bertrand de Born. Uh, look at this scene. This is the end of Canto 28. I stayed to watch the troop, and so, and I saw a thing I should fear simply to tell without more proof. Another, the threat of the ineffable once again. The poet is unable to represent, uh, feels the, the difficulty of representing that the extraordinary quality what he has seen. But that conscience reassures me, the good companion which emboldens a man under the breastplate of his felt integrity. Verily I saw, and I seem to see it still, a trunk without a head, going as were the others of the miserable herd. And it held the severed head by the hair swinging in its hand like a lantern. And that was looking at us and saying, woe is me. Of itself, it made for itself a lamp. And they were two in one and one in two. Strange arithmetical language. The divided body of Bertrand del Born. He is a maker of discord and he's being punished by having his own body divided from itself. I'll come back to this metaphor in a moment. But f the idea that for now, stylistically, is that the two is one, and one is two. How it can be, he knows who so ordains. And, and mathematical language, as if there is no <laughs> equality even possible. Remember, that was exactly the language that he, was, he used for the metaphor uh, the impossible metaphor to contain all the description of all the battlefields and all the dead people at the beginning of Canto 28. I cannot find a metaphor that somehow can come, can equal, can, 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 can give an idea, a fair idea, a proportionate idea of what I have seen in uh, this, uh, uh, these bodies, one uh, on top of the other, member limbs accumulated one on top of the other. And now Dante is using, uh, again, the language of a quantity, but uh, sort of making us think that somehow there is some equality or some rationale in the disparity of one being two. I don't know, he says, but he knows, God knows, who so ordained. I don't know. That's what the statement means. When it was just below the bridge, it raised its arm high, and with it the head, so as to bring its words nearer us. And they were. See now my grievous punishment, thou who breathing goes looking on the dead. See if any other is so great as this. Clearly, this is the first character in hell who complains that the punishment inflicted on him is really beyond all justice, beyond all proportion. There's no proportionality between what the punishment he gets and the crime he has committed. And he proceeds to explain. And that may, and that may bear news of me, know that I am Bertrand de Born, he that gave evil backing to the young he explains, I made rebellion between the father and the son. I divided father and son. Achitophel did no worse. 
and biblical uh, typology for Absalom and David with his wicked goadings. Because I parted those so joined, I carry my brain, alas, parted from its root in this trunk. Thus is observed in me the retribution. What is going on here? Uh, it's a number of things. Let me just explain a few things. Why should the Thunderborn, uh, the poet, be the, the one who bears now visible the mark of the division on his own body? We know that this is the way punishments occur. The idea of a punishment in hell is that a punishment is just usually the prolongation of what the extension of what has chosen to do in this life. You choose to um, uh, create division, and it means that that's where you, you, you belong. You did not believe in the mortality of the soul. You are always, after death, you are going to be dead, uh, and so on. So uh, this is the, the, the reflection on punishment, or if you wish, on the justice that regulates this world of hell, or what Dante calls the retribution. The, the, the word he uses is in Italian, contrapasso, it means a counterpart, I would say, or counter suffering. Last word in Italian is contrapasso, which really means uh, uh, that there is passo comes from passion, uh, to suffer. You suffer for what you have equally for what you have done. Um, that's it. So it's, in a sense, it's really the, uh, not quite, but the equivalent of the eye for the eye and the tooth for the tooth. Right? The, the, the whole idea of uh, retrib retributive justice. There is, there is uh, a, fair a fair correspondence between what you have done and what you have, uh, uh, and what you are going to suffer. Um, and, and, and Bertrand der Born seems to do, why? What is the, what is the issue with the body? The whole point of this canto is that Bertrand de Bourne divides father and son. He violates a principle of, fundamental principle of political theology. Whereby, if some of you are interested in this issue, you can read the work of a historian, a great histo medieval historian who died actually almost half a century ago. It's The King's Two Bodies by a historian by the name of Kantorovic. Some of you may know it. Uh, Kantorovics, K-A-N-T-O-W-I, etc. R-O-W-I-C-Z, Kantorovics. What is the idea of the king? What do you mean the king's two bodies? Yes, a king has always two bodies. The visible body that one has and also the, the, the mystical body of the royalty. They used to say in the Middle Ages, and we still do maybe, if you are into the news about royalty, the king is dead. Long live the king. The king never dies. And the king never dies because he has always two bodies. There are two bodies of the king. I may die as an incumbent, but the office of the king <coughs> always remains. OK, this is I, fundamental. That's one idea. So by dividing the father from the son, uh, Dante has Bertrand de Born uh, breaching the unity of the mystical body of the king. The two father and son are really one. The other metaphor that is behind it, which I, we already saw a little bit uh, um, sort of uh, traced, uh, finally traced uh, in, the, in the cant of uh, uh, Chaco, in Canto Six of, uh, of Inferno, was the idea of the body politic that, I have, that you, you may remem remember I mentioned to you. Uh, the famous fable of Menenius, who thinks that the body, the city, is really constructed like a body, an organic, uh, a set of correspondences, organic correspondences, like the human body. Uh, there's no difference between, there is a difference between patricians and plebeians, that's Menenius' argument, but they're all part of one orga or organic, unified whole. That is true for the body politic, from a Roman point of view, but it's also the principle of the so-called mystical body of the church. St. Paul, in the letter to the Ephesians, refers to the church as the mystical body of Christ. A kind of, uh, so that the state becomes a secular counter, a secular uh, extension of this mystical body. The church, we are all members, right? Some of us are thumbs, others are just toes, or whatever, hair, whatever, in this body, mystical <laughs> body of Christ. I mention this because Canto 28, you have a political focus on the, the, the Rome or Bertrand de Born 
uh, breaching the unity of father and son, but also a reference to Muhammad. And I know that there are a lot of people who just find this just absolutely odious that Muhammad should be placed, uh, the, the, the prophet should be placed here in this area of inferno. The only argument that one can have about this is that for Dante, Muhammad was actually a member of the church who created a schism, which is different from heresy. You know, we saw the heretics in Canto 9 and 10. The heretics are those who do not believe in certain uh, tenets of uh, the doctrine. The schisms are those who want to double, who divide. The word schism in Greek means to tear apart the unity, the world of unity, and doubling it. Okay, so this is really um, the, the, the argument, uh, uh, some of the, 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 the symbols and images of Canto 28. But let me go to the actual heart of this uh, problem, the question of justice uh, and the question of Bertrand de Born. We'll go back to that. Uh, when, I, when it was just below the bridge, see now my grievous punishment, thou who breathing goes looking on the dead. See if any other is so great as this. Bertrand thinks that there is no justice uh, in this hellish world that he inhabits. Uh, all the ideas that uh, uh, the ethics of Aristotle really account for the vices that are so prevalent here is just not true. Not only that's not true, uh, uh, this idea of the retribution, is it, is it an idea, this idea of the contrapasso there, uh, is that an idea that Dante really believes in? There is a lot of, what kind of justice is that, what the justice that we have in Inferno? And let me just give you a little bit of a, a, a piece of intellectual history about this whole issue. And I, I want to make it very simple because it's really not a difficult problem anyway. It's not that I'm, 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 I'm uh, simplifying the issue. It's, there are two types. The people who think, the, the, the thinkers who think about this issue are, of course, Aristotle in the ethics. And Dante is aware of the great commentary on Aristotle's ethics by Thomas Aquinas. He keeps them in mind, and, and uh, they discuss justice, and they wonder, what is justice? And so this is a great problem for Dante, because Dante is, I have been calling him a number of things, but he's clearly a poet of justice. He really believes that the whole point of his quest is to establish some degree of justice in his soul, try to find out justice in the city, and, 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 and probe the possibility of some universal justice as opposed to Lucretian ideas of anarchy and chaos in the cosmos. So there can be some continuity between the outside and the inside world. So what is the idea of justice? What many types of justice do they have? They usually think about two types of justice. The so-called the uh, retributive justice, which is the one that we have in hell here, but also distributive justice. Does Dante, is Dante aware of the two forms? Yes. It's impossible not to think of the representation of the will of fortune in, in Inferno 7 as anything less than a case of distributive justice. The distributive justice follows an arithmetical model. That is to say, in the distributive justice, as imagine the will of fortune, some have more, some have less, some have less. If someone has five, you want to establish some justice, you take away from one who has five and give to one who has zero or, or one, and you create some kind of equality. Distributive justice has equality as its aim. In retributive justice, things are a little bit different because if I say, and Aquinas reflects on this, this is not a, a concern of, at all of Aristotle, if I say an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, am I really establishing justice? Or am I just doubling the, the offense that has been perpetrated? If I, someone takes an eye, plucks an eye out of me, uh, if I do the same to whoever has damaged me that way, am I, having, am I being restored in my original position? No. No. That doesn't happen. So how, do you, how does one go around thinking about the whole question of retributive justice? Aquinas, and this is also Aristotle who goes on thinking, says, well, of course, it's always very difficult to find exact counterparts between crime and punishment. If a, if, if a clown were to um, slap the king, it's not enough for the king to slap the, the clown, clown back because one might say, well, it's, a, say it's one slap. There is the violation of the office. And then both uh, Aristotle, 
that is implied and that can never quite be restored by having the king slap the clown back. Both Aristotle and Aquinas said that's why money was invented. So one can really give whatever there is a principle of inequality can go on repaying it through other forms, other punishments. The fact is, I think, that Dante, first of all, I want to go back to the structure of the canto. It's crucial that Dante should think about this fundamental problem of justice, which is the aim of the ethical structure of the poem, and the Inferno in particular, through a poet, through Bertrand de Bourne. Not only through a poet, it's Dante himself who has just been announcing the impossibility of finding through language the exact metaphor, the exact correspondence between a reality and its representation. What Dante is doing is telling us how arbitrary are his own judgments in hell. How the notion of a precision in, uh, in the way punishments and uh, crimes are related are never quite reliable. Um, and this is the, to understand this, and I know that I, I did not ask you to read it for today, but I have to, I have a few minutes and I want to go to the, ask you to turn to the very beginning of Canto 29, because I think it becomes a retrospective gloss here on the problems that have been trying to explain in Canto 28. Dante goes through and other forms of, he will enter the world of the so-called uh, alchemists, uh, uh, those who are engaged in diabolical mutations, unnatural mutations, personifications, impersonators, uh, disguises, etc. But before he gets there, there is a little long passage. It's the first time in the whole poem that usually you know how, what the, eco the narrative economy of each canto is. Dante comes to the end of the poem, of, of a canto, and usually closes off with that particular sin or the particular sinner. This is an exception. Dante goes into Canto 29, and the, whatever situation he has been uh, describing Canto 28 keeps uh, reappearing, worries him in some way. Well, let's see what worries him about this. The many people and the strange wounds had made my eyes so drunken that they were fain to stay and weep. But Virgil said to me, what art thou still gazing at? The pilgrim is looking back at what he has seen. Why does, does thy look still rest down there among the miserable maimed shades? Thou hast not done this at the other depths. Consider if thou think to number them that the valley goes 22 miles round and already the moon is beneath our feet. The time is now short that is allowed to us and there is more to see than thou seest uh, here. Once again, uh, numbers arithmetical language, what is, the, what is the measure, what is the, how do we measure, how, how are we going to determine what is the exact correspondence? And just just to let me give you a, a little uh, uh, aside about this. Um, as you know, a great reader of Inferno, and actually he began his career as a commentator of Dante, was Galileo the scientist. That was the first work that he did. He published a famous uh, 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 work on, uh, on, on, on Inferno. He tried to find out what the actual um, size of the whole of Inferno was, just by going by this little detail about where Dante gives the radius. And he comes up with the idea that Inferno is as large as the city of Florence, uh, which is something that he probably would have said anyway, whether there was a mathematical, there was a mathematical proof for it or just his own joke, uh, I'll leave it to you to decide. Let me continue with this. If thou hadst given heed to my reason for looking, I answered then, perhaps thou wouldst have granted me a longer stay. Meantime, the leader was going on, and I went after him, already making my reply, and I added, within that den, where I held my eyes so intently just now, I think a spirit, a kinsman of his, one of my blood, weak, for the guilt that costs so much down there. Dante knows that a relative of his is in this den of hell. Then said the master, let not thy thoughts be distracted about him henceforth. 
attend to other things, and let him stay there. For I saw him below the bridge, point at thee, and threaten fiercely with his finger. And I heard him called Jerry del Bello, reminding him, I'm here I am. Thou was so wholly occupied with him who once held hot forth that thou didst not look that way till he was gone. And Dante responds, O oh, my leader, I said, the violent death which yet is yet unavenged for him by any that is a partner in his shame made him indignant. And for that reason, as I judge, he went on without speaking to me, and by this he has made me more compassionate with him. What's going on? How is this related to the previous canto? And I think, I think it's fairly clear. Dante meets a kinsman of his who has been killed, and that death is unavenged. And clearly is going to be unavenged. Is going to remain unavenged. Dante is so overwhelmed by pity and compassion, but he does not say, nor does he promise that he's going to go out and uh, take revenge against the killers of uh, his, his relative, Jerry del Bello. What he's doing is redefining the notion of justice. The idea that justice is a doubling, or could be of the crime. You know, someone is doing something, kills a kinsman of mine, I'm going to go out and kill your kinsman. Because that's the way justice could be understood. The idea of justice as revenge, as a way of establishing the precise relationship, is what Dante is giving up here completely. It's retrospectively a gloss on what I have been saying, that the notion of justice as the eye for the eye, or the tooth for the tooth, is no longer valid in this context, no longer valid. And I think this is the beginning then of Dante's worrying about uh, what is the nature of God's justice, what is how arbitrary is my own claim of authority in describing these very issues and, uh, and continuing with this reflection as we shall see uh, next time. So we, uh, let me see if there are questions now and uh, about this whole problem, the problems we've been dealing with today, or whatever problems you may have. Yes. The question is how knowledgeable Dante was of the Hellenic world since he did not read Greek. And my answer is yes, indeed, he did not read Greek uh, at all. Um, he, uh, for that matter, not did Aquinas really read Greek. Uh, but so he knew the Hellenic world through Latin translations of texts like uh, Aristotle's uh, was being the ethics, uh, the treatise on the soul, Plato, he knew. He knew medieval romances that would be dealing with the so-called, you know, medieval romances deal with the matters of France, the matters of Rome, the matters of Brittany, uh, the Roman of Alexander, which is part of uh, the Hellenic world. He knew the, uh, he lived in Ravenna, which, um, was part, by the way, till the year 1200 and more, and later was part of the exarchy, um, a Greek exarchy. The Church of Ravenna was uh, exarchate, as it's called. Um, so he he knew he knew this. This is the, there were the resources and uh, the conduit of uh, his knowledge of uh, uh, the Greek world, uh, Latin. And whatever survives in Latin, I mean, um, for the philosophical schools of the Greeks, clearly Cicero on uh, the ends of man, the finibus. Uh, that is really the, the source book for whatever he, I have been saying about Stoics, Epicureans, Aristotelians, uh, etc. Um, he had some idea, Dante had some idea of the metaphysics. I mean, he writes about uh, uh, the convivio, he writes about the need to connect ethics and metaphysics, for instance. So he knew, that's, that's what he knew. Um, 
I could even add that I'm sure that um, actually there is going to be in uh, Washington, D.C. in about a year, uh, we're going to have a conference. We're going to hold it in, 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 uh, in Washington for a number of reasons about the, on Dante and the Greeks. So if you are staying in touch with me, I'll let you know uh, what happens. But one thing that we are really looking at are the mosaics, the art world, the, com the, the relations, the connections with, um, with uh, Greek artists who have been traveling and uh, were in, uh, in Rome, in Sicily. Yes, that's what he knew. Yes? Well, the question is, uh, uh, going back to the, the problem of justice uh, in Canto 28 and then 29, how can Dante go on um, having some kind of hesitations about the idea of justice and at the same time hold the place uh, in uh, uh, hell in, uh, in place according to some criteria? Uh, and, 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 and the answer is, um, it may be a little, will appear a little bit uh, complicated, but I, I'm not sure that it's complicated. Uh, this whole language of doubts about authority that Dante has, the authority of himself as the one who can administer justice, the authority about uh, the, the himself as uh, even capable of uh, remembering that we had, which, which he has seen, and therefore the um, the authority of the poetic voice, that this is very extensive and really goes into, into all directions, has a counter to it. That's not the only aspect, the only facet of Dante's uh, text. The way I see that is that he's also capable of taking on a prophetic voice um, so that he, he appears as the one who has, by a singular grace of God, been chosen to uh, explore the, 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 the world in the beyond, which is really caught and, and, and understood in the most physical and direct way. So the two voices are simultaneously present. And so how does one uh, condition the other? I think that that, that is uh, really the tension of this poem. Um, the the uh, Dante's, Dante is, is both a prophet and Dante is the poet who knows the arbitrariness of this construction. He's the poet theologian and the poet, uh, the, 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 the poetic allegorist. Uh, uh, the two voices are simultaneously present. And what is the point of doing this? Is in many ways, this makes the poem the actual experience of a pilgrimage. That is to say, it's how you connect yourself, a kind of judgment do you give of, what, of the realities that Dante is representing that is going to reveal to you yourself who you are and where you are. It's a way of shifting the point of Dante, the, the poet, the voice of the master who can tell you how things are to the interpretive journey, to an allegorical journey where you're going to decipher and all the time involve yourself in, uh, in this story. This can be, can turn out, I think this is his wish. The story, which is his journey, can turn out to be your journey. You can tell your own story. Do you see what I'm saying? And that's, I think, the, it's a very good question, and I hope I've been clear in answering this. You may agree or not agree with it, that's, that's another story, but I hope I've been very really clear in the answer. Yes? Uh, the, the, the other question that follows, the follow-up question is, is that then that does it mean that Dante may, can one say that Dante actually doesn't have problems with the basic structure, but only with the human ability to grasp how it works? And I would agree with that. I would agree with that, yeah. 
The, however, I think that what he really has, has problems with is the notion which was a practice at the time, the notion of revenge, the way of understanding justice as revenge. Now, even the Bible will go on and tell you that, the, the, that revenge is mine, so says the Lord. But Dante would say, that's God's voice and not the human voice. So he clearly has a, an objection to that. And is there some implication? Because that's really, I think, what you're asking me. I hope that's what you're asking me. Otherwise, I'm completely off. Is there some implication that the universe itself, its divine economy, there may be something unfathomable? Right? And I would say yes, that the whole question of justice is really something we cannot quite measure with human instruments. There is one great metaphor that Dante will give in Canto, I believe, uh, 19 of Paradise, where he goes back again to the question of justice. And he talks about justice in terms of the salvation of uh, uh, the Hindus. You know, why shouldn't they be here? And what he, uh, he wonders about that. And the answer that he gives is, he says, the question of justice is like the sea. When you are really near the shore, you see the bottom, and everything seems to be the waters are clear and transparent, and you really seem to touch bottom and see the bottom. As soon as you go in, then the unfathomable ocean takes over, and the foundation, the ground of it all, remains invisible and inaccessible. Do you see what, uh, what the argument, that's the, the argument he goes on giving. It's not an issue that he has resolved here once and for all. He will go back to these questions. Yeah, I called it, because uh, it's really jargon. The question is, uh, I'm using an ineffability trope. Uh, it's, uh, it's more than a trope, it's a, it's a device. I called it topos, which is a, 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 a place where some, um, you know, they talk about topos is something that keeps, like a type, keep, keeps repeating and can be used. Dante uses this uh, idea of ineffability well, he's really talking about the impossible metaphor that can hold and represent two different realities. And I think that that's exactly the way he wants us to think of uh, crime and punishment, okay? And the relationship between crime and pu punishment, which is a metaphorical one, which is a kind of relationship that tries to uh, equal relationship between two terms. I call it topos, T-O-P-O-S, a Greek word. Uh, we call it commonplace. It means place. Uh, we say commonplace. Okay, we'll see you next time.